Welcome back to the channel. In this one, we're picking the five winners and five losers from the three World Cup warm up games. So let's not mess around and get straight into it with the first winner who probably everyone would have picked, and that's Jack Morgan. The most obvious thing to first point out is he was given the opportunity to captain the side twice, and then he was given the captaincy for the World Cup alongside Dewey Lake. And this is obviously a massive vote of confidence from Gatland, who obviously believes in him. Also, going into these warm-up matches, I don't think anyone knew who our first choice seven was. I think Jack Morgan was probably the horse lead in the race, but it was definitely going to be a battle between him and Rafael, and he comfortably beat out Rafael. And I'm happy to hold my hand up and eat some humble pie, because I thought Rafael was going to nail the first choice seven position down. But Jack's play in the two games he was involved in was superb. He was a man of the match in the first game against England and then when he played against South Africa he was probably the only shining light or one of the very few shining lights to come out of that game and it just reaffirmed the fact that he's going to be the first choice number seven going forward. Moving on to our first loser, unfortunately that's going to be Kieran Hardy. Another probably obvious choice here due to him getting left out of the squad. But unfortunately I think it was a little bit of a perfect storm for Hardy. You probably would have said that he was the third choice going into these warm-up matches. But I think with positive performances he might have pushed himself up to that second spot. But unfortunately he had some sort of family issue before the second England game that he was due to be part of. And he had to drop out and then when he started against South Africa he didn't have his finest game unfortunately along with a lot of other players in fairness but he was one of the more senior players in that team and he made a few mistakes giving away that interception that led to Jesse Creel's try and though I thought his kicking was good he just generally struggled to get into the game the same as a lot of other players did and it definitely didn't help that he was playing behind a, a pack that was getting dominated by South Africa and the reason I say it was a little bit of a perfect storm is because he had his obviously the off-field issues and then he wasn't great when he was on the pitch but I think the fact that the World Cup is in France might have also played into Gatlin's thinking in terms of if they were somewhere that was like Australia or like a day traveling away then they might have had to take these specialty positions but because they're only an hour on the plane I think he took the gamble and it is a gamble from Gatlin that he can muddle through with the two scrum halves and then if there was a serious injury Kieran Hardy could just jump on a plane and he could be back he could be in camp within a couple of hours so very disappointing for him but I think he needs to be on standby because he could be out there within the first couple of weeks but that's enough on Kieran Hardy let's move on to our next winner and that's Elliot D for D I think you've got to think that if Ken Owens was fit he might not have even been in the initial squad but he managed to get an opportunity really early on in that first England game due to Elias going off very early with that injury. Add on top of that the Dewey Lake injury and he managed to get even more minutes in the South Africa game. Add to that that the lineout was probably the best it's been for a while when he was the one throwing in. And you could easily come to the conclusion that he's possibly now the second choice hooker from maybe the fourth. And also the two other hookers that are in the squad have been injured. So he might be starting the first game, who knows. But anyway, that's enough about Elliot T. Let's move on to our next loser, which is going to be Tane Plumtree. The obvious thing to say is he was missing out because of his injury. But I don't think Gatlin specifically said that. He just said Tane's going to be missing out. In fairness, his injury did look bad in that England game but I think if you look a little bit closer he had a really really poor performance in that England game and unfortunately even though it was a small sample size in the first England game when he came on for Chinza he made a real impact and I don't know what you guys were thinking but when I was watching that I was thinking oh this guy could be a real player and that's not to say that he won't be but unfortunately he just didn't show it against England and made a lot of mistakes and I think he was probably battling it out with Chinza for that sort of utility second row back row cover but whether it was his injury or the poor game against England, he unfortunately misses out. Which is a shame because I think he could have been a real useful addition to this World Cup squad. But plenty of chances in the future, hopefully. Moving on to a Scarlet's teammate of his and the next winner is Johnny Williams. The reason I've gone with Williams for this winner is obviously he's in the squad, so he's winning. But I think the battle in the centres was very, very close. 
The only one you could have said was really nailed down was George North and I guess Tompkins for probably his experience more than anything, which means Williams was one of four players battling for only two spots. Adding on to that, that he had a bit of an injury, so we only got to see him in that last South Africa game, which wasn't really many Welsh players' finest moment on a rugby pitch. So you can imagine he was probably a bit nervous waiting for the squad selection. But Gatland obviously saw enough of what he likes in Williams. I think the fact that he had a really good end of season for Scarlet's helped and played a big part. And the fact that Gatland does tend to like his big bruising centres, I think might have given Williams a bit of an advantage. But now that he's in the squad, if you look at the other centres that we have, you would say that George North and Mason Grady are definitely more outside centres, which means he's probably in a one-on-one shootout with Nick Tompkins. Now, I think Tompkins may have an advantage playing with North before, because North is definitely going to be starting at 13. But you have to think that Williams is just physicality and all-round athleticism is going to really give him a good chance of getting picked, especially for the first Fiji game where you're going to need to be really physical and if I was the one picking the team I would certainly go with Williams over Tompkins and I would stick with Williams and North throughout the World Cup but one Williams that wasn't getting stuck with was Owen Williams and he is my next loser I actually kind of feel sorry for Williams he's got bags of talent a big boot he's physical he's just whenever he's had an opportunity for Wales hasn't really been able to put it together I also think he was quite unlucky that he got the second England game where Wales played terrible for pretty much the whole game he didn't really have any ball he got yanked off fairly early which I think Gatlin was trying to win the game and maybe give bigger a few minutes I guess a minute in the legs but I think Williams probably deserved to have a little bit more of a run out Another thing that might have gone against him was when he had the one penalty, it was a an easy gimme and it just glanced in off the post. And this is just my opinion, but I think Gatland notes stuff like that. When it comes down to the World Cup, when you get into the knockout stages, three points could just definitely be the difference between winning or losing and when you're not nailing simple kicks. It doesn't fill you with confidence that you're going to nail the difficult ones when the game's on the line. But it was definitely telling when Wales had their final game against South Africa. Bigger dropped out, Costello moved to to start in, and he still didn't bring Williams on the bench. He wanted to have another look at Max Llewellyn instead, even though Williams can play 12. But I think the real kicker for Williams is Anscombe getting named in the squad ahead of him, who hasn't actually played a minute of rugby for months now, and I think that would have been a bitter one to swallow for Williams. But moving on from Owen Williams, we're back to the winners, and my penultimate one is Team Basham. Anyone who's been watching my videos recently knows that Basham definitely impressed me coming off the bench in both games. He made a real impact against England and definitely helped Wales get back into that game. And against South Africa, he definitely added a bit of like energy and physicality when he came off the bench. Ironically, I still think he's probably our third choice seven, which is probably his number one position. But the fact that he can cover all across the back row definitely gives him an advantage. I don't think he'll start, even though I wouldn't be mad if he started in the first game at six but I definitely see him making an impact in this World Cup if it is off the bench or if it's in the sort of games against teams like Portugal or maybe even Georgia. My main point is we weren't talking about Team Basham really before these World Cup warm-up games and now I think he's definitely put his name in the hat. Now my next loser might be a little bit controversial. I've decided to go with Adam Beard. Now I know it's slightly fashionable for Wales fans to be up on Adam Beard online and I know I've been guilty of that in the past and in the recent past but I definitely feel like his position on this list is justified. Going into these World Cup warm-up games, you would think he was definitely the first choice uh, second row, and I think he probably possibly still is but there was talk of him potentially being captain but to me when you saw what actually happened when he was forced into captaincy when Dewey Lake went off it just it looked like chaos to me and now I know I'm not on the pitch I know I'm not in camp I don't know what he's like as a person but I've just never seen anything really off him this leadership wise just because someone talks a lot it doesn't make them a leader And let's be honest, anyone who's played rugby at any level has had those players on the pitch who just talk, talk, talk and are actually not very good. And to me, Adam Beard is one of those players. The main thing that concerns me is he's the line-out captain and Wales' line-out has been poor for a while now. And the only time it seemed like it's functional is the two games that he didn't play in. Now, I know I've spoken about this on the channel before and... 
not one player is responsible for messing up the whole lineup, but when you're the one who's in charge of the calls and running the line out and it doesn't function, a lot of responsibility has to stop at your door. And then, like I say, when you take into consideration that it worked and it seemed to work well when he wasn't on the pitch, I, I don't know, it's just no smoke without fire to me. He was also, I believe, one of the players who didn't clear out, which led to the Kieran Williams holding on penalty, which eventually led to England's only try in that game and just generally when he was the captain I know he's not going to be the captain but when he was it was just carnage they were arguing about what decisions they were going to make everyone was talking to the ref it was just mental the other reason why I think he could go down in the pecking order is because Rollins Rollins sorry looked actually really good he looked like he'd been playing he looked like he hadn't been injured and Dav Jenkins looked really good when he was playing he looks like he's bulked up a bit too and I definitely think he's the future all this being said I do still think Beard will be starting the first game but I think to be honest if Dav Jenkins is fit and healthy I would go with Rollins and Dav Jenkins that's just my opinion but you guys don't subscribe to this channel just to hear me just bashing Adam Beard constantly so I'm going to move on to my last ones I've kind of cheated here because I've actually gone for two players for my final winner but I feel like I can justify it because they're a unit and they play in the same positions so I've gone with Nicky Smith and Henry Thomas. The main reason I've gone with these guys is because no disrespect to anyone else but these seem like the only two who could actually hold the scrum together when they were on the pitch. I to be honest had big hopes about the Cardiff props I think their future is ahead of them and is bright. Obviously, their future is ahead of them, but I think the future ahead of them is bright. But I think Thomas and Smith definitely put their hands up as the main, the main first choice to me. Interestingly, they were coming off the bench. I'm not sure if that was, like I said previously, that it was like a bomb squad tactic that South Africa use. But I would like to see them start against Fiji. Nicky Smith has had a really good season for the Ospreys. Um, he's pretty busy around the park as well, which I like. And we know the story with Thomas, he took a gamble, um, potentially leaving Montpellier to be part of the Wales squad, part of the World Cup squad, and he was willing to accept that he might not have a club to go back to. And I think he definitely put up his hand and you could see that he's probably up there with the best scrummagers in the squad. The reason I went with these guys last is because the scrum was such an issue for basically the whole three games of these summer series, but these were the only two props that looked like when they were scrummaging that they were holding it together, and I think they put themselves out as the clear strongest scrummagers in the squad. But realistically, who wants to talk about props? So let's move on to the last winners and losers where I've actually cheated again and picked two players, and I've gone with the two young centres, and that's Max Llewellyn and Joe Roberts. Now I know this could be seen as a bit of a strange choice because before these three games you probably wouldn't have said that Llewellyn or Roberts have much of a chance of making the squad. But I would argue that their performances definitely gave them a chance of making the squad. Starting with Llewellyn, he didn't do too much in their first game against England, but he was solid, solid defensively, and he just did his job. And when he came on against South Africa, he definitely helped to stem the flow of the back line, which was just getting opened up constantly. He's a very big guy, he's young, and he's got a lot of ability, so we know Gatlin likes the big centres and the big 12s, so I thought he might be within a shout. He definitely didn't put a foot wrong, and didn't do any less than Nick Tompkins did in his performance. But I think potentially both for Williams and Tompkins, the experience factor definitely is what got them over the line. And then if you look at Joe Roberts, if we go off what we were talking about earlier, it would have been a straight shootout for one spot between him and Grady. And while I know the opposition was a lot more difficult for Grady, Joe Roberts definitely had a better performance in his game than Grady did. And I'll be honest, I heard Gatland mention the fact that he's got a left foot probably about three or four different times in different interviews. So I thought that's definitely something that he's looking at because we had Jonathan Davis who had that and is such a big help for the back line when clearing their lines. And coupled with his performance against England, he had a good line break. I know it was against less men, but it was still a line break nonetheless to put Thomas Williams in. I thought he was potentially going to get the nod. Unfortunately for him, I think Grady is just such a freak athlete that he got picked over Roberts, even though I think Roberts is way more a complete player. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not disappointed that Grady's in the team because I think he's, like I said, his athleticism is off the chart and he's definitely got a higher ceiling than Roberts will have. I just think Roberts did everything he can and he definitely did put a foot wrong. He was just 
unfortunate that you can only have a certain amount of players and he was up against someone who's a completely different level athlete. Before you switch off, I've got some honourable mentions. First of all, in the winners, Wainwright. I thought Wainwright really put his hand up in Falatau's absence, and if Falatau wasn't available for the World Cup, then Wainwright would comfortably slot into number eight. The other one is Costello. I thought he looked really good in his opportunities. He showed that his size isn't really an issue because the way he plays is so brave and he just flies and he just tackles everything anyway. And you could argue that he's probably the second choice 10. I don't know. I don't know if Gatlin still likes Anscombe, but Costello's in the in the uh, conversation. And one loser I've got is Tommy Raphael. He, unfortunately, has just come head-to-head with Jack Morgan, who's in just incredible form at the moment and has really just nailed down that spot. So, Jack Morgan being the captain also, he's not going to have an awful lot of opportunities as he is an uh, out-and-out seven specialist and can't really play anywhere else across the back row. But if there's anyone you think I've missed or you don't agree with the list, please comment below and we'll have a chat about it and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.